Okay, I'm uh, really excited to be with you today. Trisha and I are absolutely thrilled to be in Thailand. You can't, you can't believe. Um, and actually, some of what I'm going to say today reflects that, that excitement that we have about being in Asia in particular. Uh, I want to talk quite a bit about Asia this morning. Um, Calvin reminded me of a couple of things. One is um, just how difficult it is for people to understand what I do. Um, and this was best illustrated, you know, when, you, in, when your own children articulate your vocation, then you know it's got to be pretty clear or unclear. And uh, we were living in Singapore, actually, um, in 2002 and 2003, uh, right before I started the center in, in Boston. And uh, we moved as a family. I have three daughters, um, uh, Laura, Claire, and Valerie. Valerie was only about four years old. And we moved to Boston, and the very first day that we were in, you know, in our new church there was Mission Sunday. So she went off to her little Mission Sunday class, and um, they said at, at class, they said, is anybody here, um, does anybody here know a missionary? And Valerie raised her hand, and she said, my daddy's a missionary, but he never tells anyone about Jesus. <laughs> So, missionary research, you see, that was it. So that week, that week I, I uh, explained to little Valerie, I said, look, I, you know, I worked really hard, I, I, I got this doctorate so that I could help other people understand what's happening in the world, and so I, I just exhausted myself explaining my <laughs> vocation to my four-year-old. So the next Sunday, she shows up in Sunday school, and, and she, before anything happens, she raises her hand, and they say, Valerie, what, what do you want to say? She said, my daddy's a doctor, but he can't help anyone. <laughs> so that kind of sums up my life and vocation. Um, hard to understand. Now, I, my title is a little bit strange, but I hope it comes out uh, in what, I, what I'm uh, hoping to communicate. Our in unanticipated future, so it's about the future, a new vision of who we are in the light of the success in Frontier Missions. Okay, so, um, and one of the things that's going to be a little odd is that this talk about the future is going to reference the past a lot. So you've got to get used to those two things. Let me say <clears throat> that there's a lot of content in here, um, and what I did is I, I, I wrote pretty detailed notes, even for myself, I don't usually do that wrote detailed notes, and of course I have some nice slides from many different presentations that I've given over the last few years. All of this is available for you. Uh, I don't want you to have it now, because I don't want you to get distracted, but you don't really have to write much down as far as the content goes, and I think Allison might be uh, writing in between the lines if I think of something uh, more beyond here. So let's, let's think about where, where we are today, where we're going in the future, and the only way to do that is to look back. And, and it happens to be, as, as you've heard, that where we are today is, is largely the result of several key individuals, conferences, papers, short books even, uh, and I'll introduce you to them or reintroduce you probably to some of them. One of them happens to be Trisha's father, Ralph Winter. Um, there is actually another famous Ralph Winter who even lived just in the next town over. So if you watch, um, which, which Star movie? Wars? Star Trek, or no, I think it's Star Trek. It says, produced by Ralph Winter. Okay, so he was always thrilled to go to these movies because he saw his name there. And he actually, that guy is actually a Presbyterian in, um, and he, he does a lot on Christianity and film. So if you run into him, uh, he's in Glendale, right next door to Pasadena where Trisha grew up, or where, where the US Center for World Mission is. Okay, in one sense, you, we could trace our heritage and our future, let's put it that way, to this event in 1974 where Ralph Winter stood up um, and, and said, basically, uh, we're not going to get there as easily as you say. Now, the people who were saying it was easy um, are people you would know too, and I don't need to say who they are, but they were saying things like, all we have to do is witness to our neighbor who will then witness to another neighbor and witness to another neighbor, and within you know, you can do the multiplication thing. Within 31 days, you can start with one person and multiply, um, and it becomes the whole world within 31 days. 
But he pointed out that there were barriers, um, and the main one is language, ethnicity, you know, that sort of a thing, so that four out of five non-Christians are beyond the reach of near neighbors. They live in groups of people, people groups, that are, have no Christians in them, or, no, or not very many anyway. So um, this was the beginning of the whole idea of unreached peoples, and this is where we are even this morning. Uh, here's a picture of them from a few years later. Actually, just two years later, they started, they saw that this was such an issue that they started the United States Center for World Mission in Pasadena, um, and Trisha was right there, uh, along with her four, three older sisters, all um, involved in the founding of this. I actually lived, Calvin said I went to DTS in 78, I lived on this campus because the health department came to our YWAM place uh, in uh, Lake U Terrace under John Dawson. He had 22 guys living in a small room and they said you can't live like this and so we ended up living in the dorms at the U.S. Center for World Missions. So I actually ac accidentally went, ended up over there and that was the beginning of um, uh, a, a lot of involvement. Well, particularly this involvement here, uh, which was uh, 1983. So Trisha and I got married in, in 1983 and of course we were right in the midst uh, it was only, the center was only a few years old, and YWAM was getting involved. Um, so there was a lot happening in this period in our lives and, it, it, you know, in YWAM as well. Um, in fact, we were in Bangkok uh, a couple of weeks ago for a conference, and we, uh, I thought I saw somebody familiar it, at breakfast at the Bangkok Christian Guest House, and, but, I, but it was too quick, and I wasn't sure it was really him, because I haven't seen him for a long time. But then I asked somebody else, and sure enough, Sherwood Lingenfelter was at the Bangkok Christian Guest House. He's the provost of Fuller Theological Seminary. He was the, previous, the head of the School of World Mission, which is now School of Intercultural Studies. But at the time, in the 1980s, he was uh, working at Biola University in their School of Intercultural Studies. And Trisha and I flew with Sherwood all the way to Pattaya, Thailand. We brought him there for what, an early Frontier Missions conference. So we got to say hello to him. We tracked him down. And um, so his very first trip to Asia was with us for YWAM. So it was kind of an exciting thing to see him again. Of course, you already know that the Conkeys got married at the same time. They were a little bit younger. Um, I pulled, I actually, this is, if you go to conkywedding.com, this picture is there. That's what, I just Googled it and it came up. Do you know, that, is this not somebody you know? Is great it? resemblance. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, um, so all of us were young back then, right? Um, okay, so, so uh, Calvin mentioned David Barrett. He's another uh, one of these giants that you were referring to. Um, that there's actually a, a quote that you might remember, Calvin. Um, Isaac Newton said, if I have seen farther than others, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And I think that's actually a good thing for us to think about, uh, all these different people that pioneered this whole area that we now are carrying on. Um, so um, both the Conkeys and, and us were really standing on the shoulders of these earlier people, some we worked very closely with. And, and most of them have died by now. So Trisha's dad uh, passed away in May of 2009, David Barrett in August of 2011. Uh, so, so they're no longer with us. Uh, Barrett taught me how to count Christians and determine where they had not yet gone. And that's our involvement in Frontier Missions is really uh, because we are tracking down all the Christians, so you accidentally then figure out where they aren't, right? Especially if you track them down by people groups, and then suddenly you have a list of groups that don't have Christians, or don't have the Bible, or don't have films, and all of that sort of a thing. That's the beginning of it. It's, and it's actually a more, it's a, it's a more robust and accurate way of determining unreached peoples. Because if you, if you give, give out a survey and say, let's, Let's all say who, who the unreached peoples are. What happens, and what actually happened in the 1980s, is that people said things like racetrack drivers, 
and uh, nurses in St. Louis. I have no idea. That was an actual unreached people group on a list in the earliest days. Cantonese hairdressers. Cantonese uh, uh, factory workers and hairdressers. Yeah. yeah, and the royal, the British royal family was another <laughs> one. And uh, the queen would be passing out tracts actually at, at a lot of her meetings. So none of it. What it was was everybody's opinion about who was really a Christian, who wasn't, and. And that was a battle that was fought over many, many years, particularly the idea that there's no such thing as a heavily Christian unreached people. Even if you don't like the Christians there, that's not what this is all about. It's about Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and so forth. And all of the unreached people lists until 1996 had Christian groups all over them. In fact, one Pentecostal, I actually saw the, um, the form because people sent forms in to Pasadena I saw a uh, form from a Pentecostal living in Norway, uh, in, in Oslo, Norway, and he, um, he had written on the form, there are hardly any Christians here, um, just my wife and I, and I'm not sure about my wife. That's what he wrote. <laughs> so he, he, had, he put the Norwegians as an unreached people group, and it was on the list. If you go back to the published things, you'll find the Norwegians on it. And many of us felt that this is a huge distraction because there's, there's 40,000 Christian denominations in the world. And what we found is when the Baptists published their list, it was full of Methodists and Presbyterians. And, and even if it was like the Bulu Fong of Cameroon was on an unreached people list, that sounds like an unreached people, doesn't it? But, but that was a Baptist list, and those, they're mainly Methodists and Presbyterians. So it's, it's very easily, easy to get confused about this. And I think that was one of the great things. Joshua Project, the night before it was released, and this was really related to YWAM, a bunch of us said, we will not use this list if you put all these Christian peoples on it. And so we stayed up until 1 in the morning because the leader of it said to us, well, take them out then. And he was going to give the presentation the next day. And we removed 400 peoples from the list and it was published the next day and they've never added the Christians back in, although there's tremendous pressure to do so. And the main way you do that is you say an unreached people group is 2% or less evangelical. So there, then you get a lot of Catholic countries or Spain and all of that gets back on the list. And we, we've said, okay, you can work in Spain, but it's not frontier missions. That's been the argument. That's, and it's still actually, being fought today, but but uh, we did win that battle, and certainly YWAM has has uh, gone that direction. Now Barrett, um, there's a lot of fun stories about Barrett. I just wanted to tell you how you know how great it was to work with him. He told me a story of when he was invited to speak to a bunch of wealthy businessmen, um, and they asked him, you know, what are the most effective means of evangelism so they could put their money. Uh, into this and hurry up the evangelization in the world. And unfortunately for them, David and I, we were studying uh, martyrdom, Christian martyrdom. And we thought, man, this is amazing what happens, not all the time, but in certain places. So he responded, we have, we have been engaged in in-depth research on this subject, and we think the most effective means of evangelization is Christian martyrdom. So there's an awkward silence around the room until one of these guys screwed up the courage and said, Dr. Barrett, could you tell us the second most effective means of evangelization? So, and Barrett got in a lot of trouble for counting. Um, in fact, uh, people were saying, you know, counting, the Bible says counting is wrong. Why are you doing this? So he actually wrote a, 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 a very um, comprehensive article called Count the Worshippers, which is from the book of Revelation, and uh, offered a biblical defense for counting and for measuring. And it, to this day, I don't think anybody has written anything better. And of course, the problem with the census, this little Lego thing, the problem with the census is pride, not counting. Okay, so there are many places in the Bible where it says count and so on. Okay, um, another one of my favorite stories, which I'm actually indirectly involved in, has to do with rats. And, um, is there rats up there? Yeah. Oh, you should turn off this light here. This is washing out my rats. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. just straight above it. I, I don't know, you're not really involved in media like me, so you don't know yeah. that you never shine the light right on me. 
Okay, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> messing up your plan. Okay. <laughs> what it was is uh, the, the follow up to Lausanne 1974 was a conference in Manila in 1989. Um, and I was on a team of 26 people who were putting together statistics for the conference. And uh, David Barrett just thought there were all sorts of things beyond Christians that were important to understanding world evangelization. So he had me research the number of rats in the world. And I figured it out, looking at some various uh, sources, that there are about 20 billion rats in the world. So when this got into the document, and I, didn't, I was unable to go to Manila, but it got into the document, one of the world's leading experts on the urban poor stood up and said, I don't know what's gotten into these guys. They've, they've just gone crazy. Now they're even counting the rats. And everybody <laughs> burst into laughter. But David uh, pointed out, he said, look at the next line. And the next line was rats, comma, percentage of world's food supply destroyed every day. It's 25%. 25% of the world's food is ruined by rats. I don't want to tell you how, but you probably can guess. So, so um, here's an expert on the urban poor making fun of a rat statistic, and yet rats have an awful lot to do with uh, this subject. They're very, very important uh, still today. Okay, so uh, the other thing about statistics is you've got to be really careful about how you use statistics. And I like this little story um, uh, related to the misuse of statistics. An African mother of already three was pregnant with her fourth child. One evening, the eldest daughter says to her dad, Do you know, Daddy, what I found out? No. The new baby will be Chinese. What? Yes, I've read in the paper that statistics show that every fourth child born nowadays is Chinese. <laughs> so um, so if, if we want to have more Chinese, those of you that have three kids, I guess it's a little late for us, but those of you with three kids have a fourth child, it'll certainly be Chinese. Okay. So um, another, another um, person that I want to introduce you to, and this is probably the core of what I want to say, um, what I want to share with you is actually very simple, but, but because I have extra time, I'll make it real complicated, okay? Um, and I want to give you a background on it, and I really believe it's, it's um, important for us, it's important for, for, for me, it's important for you as well. And uh, this comes, this is one of those seminal documents that's just tucked away in a book of essays somewhere, but this is why we're here today. It really is why we're here along with Winter, Barrett. Here's another person that you should be familiar with. Let me just read a fairly lengthy passage here, and then I'll tell you who this is. Let us begin with a visit to the theater. It is a crowded theater with a huge stage and a stream of actors passing across it. Everyone in the packed auditorium can see the stage, but no one sees the whole of it. People seated in one place cannot see the entrances left, though they can hear the actor's voice as he enters from the wings. Seated somewhere else, the view is obstructed by a pillar or an overhanging balcony. Go up into the balcony and the arch cuts off the top of the set. As a result, though everyone in the audience sees the same play and hears the same words, they have different views of the word and action according to their seat in the theater. Those on one side get a sharply focused view of certain scenes with those placed elsewhere do not have to the same degree. And people in the balcony are puzzled to hear laughter in the stalls when they themselves have seen nothing to cause it. But the position is re reversed when the scene changes and the main action is on another part of the stage. Of course, it's possible to get up and change one's seat um, but while this may provide a different view of the stage, it will not enable a view of the whole stage at once. And the way a person who changes seats understands the performance as a whole will be affected by where they were sitting for the first act. Certainly some people will see more than others. Those who lean forward eagerly, those who crane around this obstructive pillar will see more than those who loll back in their seats. Those who get up at the interval and compare notes with friends sitting elsewhere in the auditorium will perhaps understand the action best of all. But it is a condition of being in the auditorium 
uh, will perhaps understand, excuse me, condition of being in the audience, that what we see most clearly is governed by where we are sitting in the theater. The play we are watching is the drama of life. The whole human race can see the stage on which the drama is enacted, but the focus varies according to the place in the auditorium. Now this drama has a development which is vital to the plot, which we may, may call the Jesus Act. For this act, the conditions are the same as for all the others. Everyone sees the stage, but no one sees the whole stage. People in the auditorium view the Jesus Act on the part of the stage most open to where they are sit sitting. We may think this is a strange theater and that God, the great actor manager, might have at least provided better conditions for viewing the vital act. Since it, since it is so crucial, could it, it had not been put in a different theater without those inbuilt visual obstacles? Or could he not have made some other arrangement whereby everyone would see it in much the same way? A moment's thought, however, shows that this will not do. The Jesus Act is crucial to the drama of life. It is not a separate play. It is necessary to see the Jesus Act from the same seat in the theater as we see the rest of life because it belongs to the rest of life. Our seat in the theater is determined by a complex uh, of conditions. Where we were born, where our parents came from, from what language we speak, what, child, what our childhood was like, and so on. People who share broadly similar conditions form cultural blocks, like, rather like blocks of seats in the theater, from which the view of the stage is very similar. Culture is simply a name for the location in the auditorium where the drama of life is in progress. Viewing the Jesus Act in that drama will involve some reading or hearing of the Christian scriptures. Once again, what we see or hear in the process will be affected by where we are sitting in the auditorium. People seated in another part of the house will see some things we cannot be, be unable to see some things that seem important to us. They cannot see them not through blindness or willfulness, but because they've been sitting in a different place. From that place, they may well be seeing that the Jesus Act is fitting exactly into earlier developments that escaped our notice because of that overhanging, overhanging balcony that interrupts our view so constantly that we have forgotten its existence. This limitation is a necessary feature of our hearing the gospel at all. For the gospel is not a voice from heaven separate from the rest of reality. It is not an alternative or supplementary program to the drama of life which we are watching. The Jesus Act, the gospel, is in the play. That is the implication of the incarnation. It has to be received, therefore, under the same conditions as we receive other communication, though the medium of this, through the medium of the same uh, faculties and capacities. We hear and respond to the gospel. We read and listen to the scriptures in terms of our accumulated experience and perceptions of the world. Okay, that's lengthy, but that sets the stage, no pun intended, for uh, where we are today. And this is Andrew Walls, Scottish miss missiologist Andrew Walls. And he went to Sierra Leone as a young man to teach Christian church history. And then he noticed that where he was living was like the history he was teaching of the first and second centuries of Christianity. And, uh, and that affected how he began to think about history and about missions. And he's a very important person to read. A uh, couple other brief, briefer comments here. Walls said, incarnation is translation. When God in Christ became man, divinity was translated into humanity as though humanity were a receptor language. Here was a clear statement of what otherwise would be veiled in obscurity or uncertainty. The statement is, this is what God is like. This is one of the earliest pictures of, or, uh, depictions of Jesus, by the way. Um, but language is specific to a people or area. No one speaks a generalized language. It's necessary to speak a particular language. Similarly, when divinity was translated into humanity, he did not become generalized humanity. He became a person in a particular locality, in a particular ethnic group, at a particular time and place. So this is where we're at. We, we're here because of all these different cultures and the fact that Jesus came 
and, and lived among us as a particular person in a particular place. That's why we have lots of work to do um, because of the diversity of humanity. Now, one of the interesting things uh, about this is that we have all these different national distinctives, things that mark out each nation, you know, there's shared consciousness, shared tradition, uh, patterns of relationship. They're all within the scope of discipleship and how we see Jesus. And it would be fun, actually, if I, we had time to go through and look at all kinds of different pictures of Jesus from around the world. I've collected a lot uh, myself. Uh, on the right, we have the most popular picture of Jesus in the world. And it was painted by an American in 1947. Um, I grew up with this picture. Uh, it's Warner Salmon's portrait of Jesus. Um, but uh, many other people have painted Jesus to look quite different. And this is actually a, a play off of Warner Salmon. And the point here uh, on the left, the point here is that we actually don't know exactly what Jesus looked like. And the fact that there's a billion of that right image around the world tends to make us think that's what Jesus looked like, but it's, it's actually not likely. Not look likely that he looked like an American or, or um, so on. So um, that's another thing we have to think about. And one thing this reminded me of, uh, we could look at how, how different stories in the Bible have been painted over the centuries. This is a famous one. Uh, the Road to Emmaus, this is Caravaggio. Um, and here's Here's a painting from Italy in the 17th century of 17th century Italians at, on the road to Emmaus, essentially. Again, this, this reflects their culture very much, and it's beautifully done, a classic painting. Um, here's a newer painting uh, from the Philippines of the same uh, event. And I actually really like this, um, because remember, they didn't recognize Jesus, so in this painting, uh, the artist paints Jesus as a woman. Um, and the laughing and the fact that there was some kind of camaraderie in the group that they couldn't quite understand. I just think there's a lot in this painting. It's not saying Jesus was a woman, again. Um, it's, but but it, is this painting more accurate? Because we're used to it and so on. I don't know. This, is a, this painting is allowed as well. Okay. Andrew Walls, who I mentioned earlier, came up with two principles uh, related to this idea of the auditorium and, and culture and all of that. And they're very simple. One is called the indigenizing principle, which means that Christianity um, is translated, incarnated into all of the cultures of the world and feels at home in all of those cultures. And that's, again, what, what we're doing here is we're interested in that. Uh, we think that's important that Christianity, you know, culturally relevant, uh, is a phrase uh, we use now. Uh, so we're looking for that. We're looking for indigenous Christianity. And that's really what I want to talk about uh, briefly this morning. The other principle, though, is the pilgrim principle. This is Croapatric in, in Ireland. I think it is. Um, and the pilgrimage principle is that we're actually not at home. None of us are at home here on Earth. We're just passing through, we're just visitors. And so we have this amazing dynamic where Christianity goes deep within every culture, but at the same time, uh, it's, not, it's not trapped in any one culture. And so Christians, you can meet Christians from all over the world, and there's a sense of, of uh, fellowship and of, of being brothers and sisters in Christ, right? So that, and that's the universal side of it. So the particular principle is going deep within a culture, indigenizing, but the universal principle is that we're all in the same family, even though we're in all kinds of different cultures around the world. Okay, so these are kind of basic principles, but you're gonna see that things have not quite gone uh, where we're hoping for them to go. Okay, here we have um, the source of some of what I'm gonna show you is from this atlas that uh, Calvin mentioned. Uh, we put a painting actually from Southwest China on the front. This is the resurrection of Jesus. You can't see the whole thing here, but it's in a particular art style from Southwest China, and we thought that would be appropriate. Then we're doing a 10 volume series. Um, so at two o'clock this afternoon, I'm on a Skype call with uh, an Egyptian Coptic Christian who is editing the second of our 10 volumes. 
um, and, and uh, we're talking about you know the the uh, people who are contributing to it. The atlas was was quite a success for Edinburgh University Press. They asked us to follow up, and we said we want to do a volume on each of the regions of the world. And all the essays in the volumes are from people in from those places. This is the that principle, the indigenizing principle. So we don't want somebody from Germany to write about Egypt, right? We want an Egyptian to write about Egypt. And that's, there's 350 essays across the 10 years. So it's a lot of work, but we're just doing one at a time. The, the Sub-Saharan Africa volume, this was a mock-up. It's, it's gonna look like the Atlas, but the books are smaller. And we're gonna have indigenous art. They put the North, that North Africa indigenous art on the South Af or the Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have, Artwork from Kenya that'll be on this first volume, and then this picture of Jesus will be on the second volume of North Africa and Western Asia, also known as the Middle East. Okay, now here's just a few things. I'll, I'll zip through these because remember, you have all these notes, you don't have to take any notes, just try to understand where we're headed. Uh, Jesus was born, lived, preached, and died in Asia, yet he's often seen as a Westerner. And this is the problem that we're going to look at. And the reason we're looking at it is because of the indigenizing principle, remember, which we are very, very much committed to. One of the shocking things that I'm working on is this. I came up with this a long time ago. It's in the atlas. But one of the shocking things is you see that arrow there? Half of all the Christians, more than half of all the Christians in the world for 900 years were Asians and Africans. But if you go to my, my seminary, you go to Fuller, you go, you go to any seminary, even here in Thailand, um, and you take a church history course, you start reading the book, and what is it? You open the book and read about the first 900 years, and you open it, it says Europe, 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 Europe. And the, that, that's, a, that's an oversight, it's a cultural oversight, and it has to do with that later period where you see hardly any people from Asia, Africa, and Latin America are Christians after 1500, even after the Reformation. And of course, we'll talk about that big shift in just a minute, which you're familiar with. Uh, I tried to introduce a course at Gordon-Conwell on a history of Asian Christianity. And we only had, we, we had to cancel the course because we had six Asians who signed up, which is actually the opposite of what, we, we don't mind Asians in the course, but we were putting the course together saying, this is your history no matter where you're from. But we failed, we're gonna try again. Um, here's a map that was put together in 1958, the year that I was born, of the spread of Christianity. And you'll see, if you, you can see where um, Jerusalem is, you can see where Syria and the places you think about. But look at the spread of Christianity in the other direction. This is a story that's not told. Uh, again, this is, it's, it's often called the hidden history of Christianity because it's not told. Um, and here's a nice map that was developed, a stylistic map, which has Jerusalem at the center, Europe is one of the leaves, Asia and Africa. And this is really more of an accurate depiction even of what's happening in Christianity. And a colleague of mine, if you want to follow up on this, uh, wrote a book called The Lost History of Christianity, which looks like this. And he used, actually used that map. Philip Jenkins uh, used that map and uh, tell, tries to retell this story about Christianity in Asia and Africa. But this is a minority report, if you, a minority position, okay? Um, now here's, here's a map, a chart showing the percentage of Asia's population that's been Christian the entire history of Christianity. And you can see that there's an earlier period which is more significant even than where we are now, although we're headed into a brand new fresh period here. What's important is, you know, that's a, still a minority, almost 20% at one point, almost 20%. It's about 8% now, okay? So it's half of what it was at, at the height of of the Christian penetration of Asia, which was, by the way, along the Silk Road, uh, which is a course I have been teaching uh, at Gordon Conwell. Okay, so here's a percentage of the whole world that is Asian. See, it's a lot higher, and you put these two together, and that gap represents the lack of uh, indigenous church growth in Asia. In other words, 
if Christians were equally spread around the whole world, they're about a third of the world's population, then those two lines would be the same. In fact, the blue line would move up to the green line. So this gap represents part of our challenge. It's another way of thinking about uh, frontier missions. Okay, here's the other end of the chart. You'll see if you were around in 1981 or just a little bit after, um, you're at one of the steepest, um, uh, the steepest lines in, in cha of change in this graph. So as of 1981, for the first time in a thousand years, there are now more Christians in Africa, Asia, Latin America than in uh, Europe and, and North America. Okay, and this fact uh, was recognized. Uh, I woke up on Christmas morning. I shouldn't have been looking at my Twitter feed, but I saw this tweet early Christmas morning, and it was this map, which is based on our research. It's, it was The Economist. As Calvin said, people outside of Christian circles are paying attention to this. This shows where Christianity is growing the fastest. And it's based on our data and other data. And it also shows the statistical center of gravity of Christianity, which I place in Timbuktu. That means there's an equal number of Christians in the north, south, east, and west of that point. And it shows how it's been shifting because it was in Madrid about 100 years ago. In other words, most Christians lived up there. Now most Christians live down here. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, in one sense, this is pretty a boring subject because Christians have been about a third of the world's population throughout this entire period. If you're in the hospital and you look over at the machine and it looks like this, this is the last thing you're ever going to see. All right, so it's not good. It's a flat line, they call it. All right, but uh, this is stuff you know. I'm just re refreshing your mind. A uh, hundred years ago, uh, over 80% of all Christians were Europeans or North Americans. You see Europe's dominance there, 66% of all Christians. Watch what happens in 100 years, bam. Europeans only 25%, even North Americans down to 12. Together that's less than 40%. I just did a con conference in Bangkok and in Chiang Mai, a thousand Thai Christians in Bangkok, I could not believe it, and, a, and 500 Christians up in Thailand, Thai Christians, and the conference was called SHIFT, which is this shift. And uh, they had actually not heard much about this before. Um, and they were really excited to think about what's happened in Christianity and that they were an important part of it. Uh, so it went better than I thought it might have gone. Um, this Chinese woman, I think I might, if you were here in Jaipur, you might have seen this because I've used this over and over. I think it's very helpful. She moved to Berlin and, uh, and noticed how different Germans were from the Chinese, right? Okay, and so she put together a bunch of icons. How many of you have seen this? Several, okay, good. So I'm just reminding you, all right? So Germans on the left, Chinese on the right. So Germans right on time, Chinese uh, not, not necessarily right on time. It's okay to be a little late. Latin Americans, it would just go all the way around the clock, right? So it's a little bit. Okay, handling of problems. Germans walk straight through the problem. Chinese around. Um, queue and waiting. Germans lined up neatly. Chinese bunched up against the window. Opinion. Germans very direct. Chinese going around and around. Um, contacts. Here we have the Germans with just a few contracts, the contacts. The Chinese in a great web of relationships. Now when I first saw this, the first thing I thought of when I got to this one is I thought, wait a minute, this is like, you know, Christianity. What we just said is a hundred years ago, Christians were mainly Germans, and today they're mainly Chinese, or from the global south, because China's in the global south by the UN definition. So Christianity, you know, today is demographically more like the right than the left, and in fact, if you read the New Testament, you get a feeling that looks more like the right than the left, especially when you get to this, the way of life, the in individual versus the group. And I remember growing up in the Jesus movement in Southern, well, in Minnesota, then Southern California, I read the New Testament over and over again. Every time I saw the word you, I translated that to mean me personally. 
um, as a singular thing. But when I got around people who've been to seminary, they said, actually, every, virtually every reference in the New Testament that's translated into you in English is plural. So there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the Bible based on, on, um, on my own culture. And I'm three-eighths German, see, so I, I kind of act more like the left myself. Um, there's a really great book, by the way, if you ever get time to look at it. It's called Misreading Scripture Through Western Eyes. And it really shows you that if you're from the West, here's nine different significant ways that you are likely to misread the scriptures because of your culture. This is one of the big ones. Individualism is probably at the heart of, heart of the problem. And actually, Jason, when Jason gets in here, and the whole honor and shame thing is really part of this discussion, so it's really a nice uh, connection to him. But for us, the problem, getting back to why, what I'm really trying to say to this morning, is that the problem is that most of the theological books, church planting manuals, uh, the teaching, even in YWAM, is from the West to the rest of the world. So you get people in Asia and other places who are saying, wait a minute, this is wrong. And one of my colleagues wrote a book called Mangoes or Bananas, the quest for an authentic Asian miss missiology and, and theology. Hua Yun, he's a, a Malaysian Methodist bishop, and he said, it's a shame because Christianity in Asia is like a banana. It's yellow on the outside, but white on the inside. All the training, all the thinking, the ideas are based on, on Western ideas. And that's a shame because, look, Aristotle, I, I mean, you probably don't know, but your, your faith is largely determined by Greek thought because that's what early Christians were fighting with. But in Asia, it's Confucius and Buddha and all kinds of other things, which would be a more natural thing to engage as, a, as an Asian. But that's not done. The Greek ideas are brought right into Asia and they don't really match. They're a little bit helpful, but they don't really match. So, so Hua Yun said, wouldn't it be great if Christianity in Asia was like a mango, yellow on the outside, yellow on the inside? And that's a project that he continues to work on. He's been invited to universities, seminaries to teach in, in the Western world and he stays in Malaysia instead. So he, he's really committed to this. Even in Chiang Mai, we have this statement. The biggest issue the church in Asia is facing is a severe violation of the incarnational principle from both missionaries and local church leaders. Contextualization has been very poor, making Christianity foreign to local people. Okay, this is probably familiar to you because this is kind of the world that you're inhabiting. But I want to take it a little bit further. Remember, I'm working on a 10-volume series on global Christianity, and I'm reading all these essays by people from these different countries about Christianity in their country. And I just read the uh, essay from Mozambique, and here's how it ends. So it's talking about what's, what's happening in Mozambique in Christianity. The churches, in, this is in 2016, okay? This is not 100 years ago, this is 2016. The churches in Mozambique are still passing through a transitional period in which they operate by default on the basis of the legacy left by the missionaries. They need visionary leaders to shape their vision and mission. Their biggest challenge is to achieve a shift. How do you like that? A shift from being churches that receive and implement policies fashioned in the West to being churches that engage in proactive ways with the dynamic of popular culture. Such a shift is needed in order to ground Christianity in the hearts of the people for the benefit of coming generations. Now, just to make clear, what I, the whole thing I'm trying to focus in on here is really simple, and this is it. And this should, this should really strike you as, as uh, ironic. And that is this, it's, it's so simple. You're here, you're very concerned that your media is culturally relevant among peoples who have never heard the gospel before, right? Back in Africa, in Latin America, and in places where the gospel has been in Asia, 
There's a cry from the heart of existing Christians, some who've been Christians, have Christianity for a hundred or more years, saying we don't have a culturally relevant Christianity. We're still operating on, on what was given to us from the outside. Let me tell you that the, I'm, I'm involved in these two worlds, but these two groups of people do not talk to each other. They do not know each other. Um, because these are separate things. Where Christianity has been, where Christianity is about to be. Okay, so that's, this is one of the main things I wanted to say. Now, I'm saying it to you because when I'm with, when I'm with audiences that don't know about Frontier Missions, I say, do you, as, you, as you're seeing the need to see Christianity go deep into your own culture, are you not sympathetic with the idea of Christianity being culturally relevant where it's being preached on the frontiers? And people will admit, yes, that's, we're sympathetic with that. I'm asking you, are you sympathetic with this huge project in the rest of Christianity, which is renovating itself based on the very principles that are driving your ministry? Your ministry recognizes it. I'm saying look back over your shoulder and be sympathetic with this huge project within Christianity. Okay? So that's, that's, that's kind of where I'm going. All right, now, it's worse than, than you think. This is a really no, another fantastic book, uh, Rescuing the Gospel from the Cowboys. It's really unfortunate because R Richard Twist, did you guys meet Richard? Yeah, yeah. yeah so did I. So Richard Twist died of a heart attack about four years ago, age 52. And what he was doing, he was studying world Christianity at Asbury Seminary, and he's a Native American. He's reading about how Christians around the world are saying, we want an authentic indigenous gospel. He's reading the history of his own people, and he's mourning the, the fact that his own people did not receive um, or were not allowed to develop an indigenous form of Christianity. Do you know that in the boarding schools, when, 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 most, peop, when most Christians were evangelizing Native Americans, they were put into boarding schools, and that when they would speak their native tongue, they were hit with a stick. See, this is, this is the opposite of what we believe. They, they could not speak their mother tongue. Because to be a Christian, you had to kind of move into a whole new way of thinking, which involved, which involved language in this case. So there's this Christianity, which was so European, um, or even North American a little bit later, uh, that it was just not fit at all for Native Americans. And, and we're talking, for those of us that are Americans, uh, or even the story in Australia of the Aboriginals, there's many stories like this. Um, how can we support this new, new evangelization when we have such a mess in our own history? I mean, we, I think we should support the new evangelization, but we also have to be careful to remember that not always have, have, have done a great job uh, in the past. And of course, in his book, which again I recommend, he says exactly what you and I believe and what Andrew Walls has said. What we're seeking is a place where the gospel brings freedom and spiritual follow to, power to follow Jesus with our hearts, souls, minds, and strength while we still fully embrace our tribal identity, traditional customs, cultural forms, worldview, and rituals. We see a place where we are no longer seen as a perpetual mission field of the dominant culture church, but rather a place where we are honestly embraced as co-equal participants in the life, work, and community of Christ followers as indigenous people. I mean, this could be this could be your purpose statement. I mean, or behind your purpose statement. This is what you are hoping will happen among unreached peoples. I want to, I'll say it later again, but I just want to say it now too. Surely, surely you are not thinking that all you want to see is pr produce a culturally relevant gospel, people become Christians, and then you don't care what happens to them after that. Surely that's not the case. Surely you would be a, a, you'd be you'd be grieved if 20 years from now you went back to the Lampunese and they were all acting exactly like Koreans, you know, 
So, so it's not just a Western problem. I'll get to that in a minute. You would be grieved to see that because that's not the future that you were hoping for when you brought these, the media into this group. You're not, it's not, this is not just hoping that they'll become Christians and that, that'll be it. There's much more to it. I, I hope you're sympathetic with this huge project, which you're, you're involved in now. Because you're bringing the gospel to new people groups, you are involved in whether or not they really get an indigenous Christianity. And I think you're off to a great start, but I would say don't underestimate how this can go wrong. You look back at history. Okay, so um, quick, quickly a few other things. Um, that can't be right, is it? Uh, it is what? 45 minutes, so we're we'll okay. so Really? We're going to change okay. some things, but we want to make sure you focus on some of the last questions. Okay, okay. Uh, no, I, I'll switch. I'll switch. Okay, so you got the idea. I'll say one word about each of these slides. And you have all the notes, so I don't have to... Okay, so here's the big one. Half of all Christians in the world would be Africans by the year 2050. Unless something really amazing happens in Asia in which case it would be Asians. But it, you can see that the one that's going up is Africans, and the one that's going down is Europeans. Study that later. And of course, Africans are getting their own study Bible now, which has completely different insights in it um, as a result of um, Africans thinking about what's in the New Testament, Old Testament. Um, I'll skip this, but this just shows the whole history of Christianity. Just a nice little slide um, of where Christians we're evangelizing on the Silk Road, and then we have Christianity stuck in Europe, all right? And now we have world Christianity. Um, Christendom was not a great place. Europe was not a great place to develop missiology. Our missiology was developed by people who didn't interact with people of other religions. That is not a good place to be, and therefore a lot of our thinking, even to this day, is not really oriented towards the very kind of thing that we're doing here. You're not going to get a lot of help from the Western world. I am just tired of reading books about religion by people who don't, who never even know people in other religion. I think it needs to switch direction. That was one of my other points. Finishing the task is not about quickly bringing a Western gospel to the unreached. And here's a little bit of a sensitive thing maybe. Revelation 7, 9, we're not going to be singing How Great Is Our God. As much as I like that, and this is a beautiful video if you've seen it. How many have seen this video? You should watch it. It shows how people all over the world are singing How Great Is Our God. Okay, the good thing is God is great. The bad thing is it was written in Texas. It really is not representative of what's going on around the world. What Revelation 7, 9 is, is the peoples of the world bringing their gifts together. And I can tell this has not shifted in direction. Even great big international meetings, the songs have all been written in Australia or in Texas. You know, um, they, they, we need to see a change of direction in this so that when we get together, we actually receive the gifts from all these cultures, including some of the peoples that are new to this some that you are involved with, why are we not singing their songs? We need to, we need to sing songs in the other direction. Okay, there's white people all over the place trying to make, make a difference. Um, okay, here's, here's the one, one of the points I wanted to make. <clears throat> this is a scripture that came to me when I was praying about this. Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him does what is right. You can say, okay, that was Jews and Gentiles. I think we're at a, at a moment like this again. The sheets come down and it's, it's saying that, that non-Western Christianity has something to offer. We should wake up every day and say, I now realize that this is true. We have not done this yet. The, the push is from the West to the rest in almost everything, theology, music, everything. It's very strong, hard to stop. There's some great people pushing back the other direction. This is, this is one of them, Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Ensemble. You can look at that later. Um, okay, uh, people, here's, a, here's, a, here's another thing. People in the non-Western world are increasingly identifying themselves with people around the world and people in the West are increasingly isolating themselves. 
So this is a, another trend. How it applies to us, we'll have to think about. Then we have to integrate evangelism and social justice. That's another part. And we have to also have significant relationships with people in other faiths. Um, back in 1974, Ralph Winter figured out that 87% were beyond near neighbor Christians. Uh, in 1994, we figured out that 87% of all money was spent reaching out to Christians. And in 2014, uh, or, or before, we figured out 86% of Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists don't personally know a Christian. This is one of our great challenges. So how are we gonna hurry up? You got the faster. I've been talking about deeper. You already got further because that's where you know, the spreading out further. The faster, it's hard to go fast when you don't know people. And it's also a little dangerous to go fast when you don't know people. But this is a legacy of that Christendom when a lot of people thought the best thing is for Christians to all be together in one place. Okay, then I have some global issues, which you can read about later, related to identity, the fact that we're all in this together. Um, that's another problem. There's a lot of divisions in Christianity. We need to be civil to each other. Sorry, I can't tell you this joke. You can read it. Um, we need to cooperate. This is what a lot of people think of when they think of Christianity. Uh, just a bunch of different unrelated pieces, but it's really this. And I shouldn't have a German I gotta change this, this is a German auto. Should have a Chinese auto there, okay, a red one. Uh, we need to work together. Okay, what about you guys? You can create tomorrow, how about that? Okay, yeah. a few questions. I'll just do a few questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, okay. please don't feel rushed. Yeah. We've given you more time already. Yeah, I didn't, I, I think I... Is, we've already made it open, so you can continue to go. Okay. We don't want you to rush. All right, so I got, but I got through the, that's, that's the content okay. that you can look at. Okay, let's just ask a few questions. You're already well into this. This isn't like I've come up with some great thing, and I really don't know exactly how all this applies, except for that one thing. I would hope that you have a vision for the indigenization of Christianity around the world, where it already is, maybe you won't work on that, but especially where it isn't yet. And it's not just a little spark to get going and then move on. Even if that's what you end up doing, your heart is for depth. You, you want to see the gospel go deep. Now, are we mobilizing the right people in the right way? That's an obvious question to ask, given especially that half of all Christians are going to be African by 2050. So who is it that's going to be doing, as you're looking at um, mobilization, and you heard it from Bevan, you know, what about culturally relevant mobilization? That's something that I think is clear to think about. Um, then I think something you also need to think about, most of you are living, well, you're living and operating in a place where you know people of other religions, but most Christians don't. And surveys have shown that especially evangelicals, Pentecostals do not really know a Buddhist, Muslims, Hindus, they don't know even about that. And they score terribly back where I live. Simple questions like the Quran is the holy book of A, Muslims, B, Hindus, C, Buddhists, and people, half the people get it wrong. See, that's not a hard question, all right? And then, um, integral mission, I, I wish we could talk more about that, but I think even though you're focused on evangelism, you should be sympathetic with the fact that especially Latin Americans, especially Latin Americans have said, we need integral mission, holistic mission, um, evangelism and social justice together. You're already seeing, as you're talking to millennials, right, in the Western world, that this is very important to them. It's not an oddity, it's actually coming back because we have an artificial divide in the West between evangelism and social justice that's not healthy. So this call from Latin America for integral mission is actually a corrective for the body of Christ. So hopefully you'll be on board. Again, you're not gonna go out and start things. I'm just saying, it's, this is more a vision than tactics. I'm talking about leadership here, about how you feel about things. Uh, I also have a, a vision for you uh, drawing together, together the right partners. And part of that, again, is do you really want high, you know, highly culturally specific groups 
uh, coming into these unreached peoples and planting a lot of churches? Do you want Western churches? But do you want heavily Nigerian or Korean or Brazilian churches? That's, you you, you want to make sure that what follows and people that use the, the culturally relevant materials are people who are going to build indigenous communities. And you might have a little bit more responsibility for that than you think. And you want your films to be good, but do you actually not have a little responsibility for who shows up and what they do? You can't control it, but just think about it at least. Um, and then bridging, building bridges to and from unreached peoples, because this connection idea is really the most important within global Christianity. That's what makes global Christianity. That's why the Thai Christians that I spoke to a couple of weeks ago were so hungry for connections with Christians from around the world because that's natural. That, in a sense, is that pilgrim principle. And, and Thais have been, uh, have been uh, overlooked in both ways. First of all, their Christianity has not been as indigenous as it should be, and they know that's the case. And they've been cut off from the rest of the world. That's not good. That's two, two things that need to be addressed. All right, then um, here's a word, another passage of scripture that I felt was important for you. Uh, and, and if you read this carefully, you'll see uh, that we're talking about the further you know, the whole idea of going further, but also doing a really good job where you are so that you can then go further. So I, I can't get, in, get into it now, but that's something you can look at um, later. And then uh, how, how does our training reflect communitarian worldviews? Like I, that's the diagrams I was showing earlier. Um, this is a big area. And the pushback in teaching within Youth with a Mission has, has really not reached the point where it matches even the demographics. Remember saying, hey, in YWAM, it's great, you know, 50, 60% of us are non-Western. But the teaching is still very much based on a Western worldview, and it has yet to be transformed by our community. Um, and that's, that's a big project, even for us. Um, and, and that's not, why, not, there's nothing wrong with YWAM. This is what happens in these kind of situations, it's true. And YWAM has a head start. Um, and this is, remember that Nan Ning meeting? This is really what I was trying to communicate. Uh, it was interesting, I spoke to the leadership about the changing in, um, demographics of Christianity, and then I said, this is, should change who we are. And that's actually what I'm saying to you, that your contact with people groups on the, on the fringes should transform you. Your Christianity is incomplete because it has not really received these gifts from uh, people, other people. That's why I told uh, Thai Christians as well. So, so what happened at Nanning is I said this, and three non-Western people came up to me privately afterwards and they said, this is our biggest grief in YWAM is that it's so Western and we, we just you know, can't see it turning the other, the other way. So that's something to to consider. Um, and then this is really the big question then, is how will we be shaped by the diversity? That's the unanticipated future. You thought you were just here to make sure that all the peoples of the world were, were reached, but they're reaching them should transform us. Amen. We should become people we were not expecting to become. And, and even the diversity of your leadership and your staff should have a transforming effect on what Calvin and Carol started many, many years ago. So, so there's something, something new that is coming, and, I'm, and I think one of the most important things is just for you to be open to that. I can't tell you what it is, but I can tell you kind of the, out, the broad outline of it. You want to get away from this. This is not, this is not Create International in any way, okay? Uh, that you just go from McDonald's to Gap to Starbucks and so on. Uh, the Western part of the part of uh, globalization and what I am hoping for is the reversing of the flow listening to Africans Asian Latin Americans Islanders that the ideas reverse and go in the opposite direction even in Thailand I said you've translated enough English books now 
Uh, what has to happen is Thai books, books written by Thai Christians, need to be translated the other direction. Reverse the flow of ideas. And that's the problem in, in the area of worship, is that the, the flow is so strong. All the money and these are great songs and everything. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the pressure that is put on everybody else around the world. Um, and I also hope you can see the big picture. Here's part of what I think when I think about you guys. Here's, look at this beautiful flower. It's very specific, you know, it's one thing, but it's in a meadow, and there you are, focused down, looking down at that one flower, and I'm hoping you can see that you're in a big meadow, and that you're actually impacted by what's going on uh, all around you, which again is this shift. So, to wrap up, um, hoping for diverse staff and leadership in the future, I mean, I think that's what, what is gonna happen. You probably have more associates outside of YRAM because of what you're doing, and that should also have a transforming effect. Your partners um, d deepen the cultural bridges beyond initial evangelization. So your job is to be culturally relevant. But what about building bridges by pulling in some of what's coming out of these different cultures into Christianity? I don't know if you've thought about that. That's something that you want to do. Be an advocate for truly indigenous Christianity all around the world. I can't see how you can't do that. I can't see how you can just hope for a little spark and then leave it. I think you want a truly indigenous Christianity. And I believe then, finally, that this will align you with God's vision for the nations. Um, and what I'm saying there is that his vision is for a deep indigenous Christianity among every people of the world. You're aligned with that with your culturally relevant media, but you're, you should think of yourself as aligning with that, aligning with what comes next and what's gone before. That's important, I think, not really just a specific single task, but one that do, lines up with this, with the Revelation 7-9 vision. So that's what I'm hoping uh, for you. And I think I'll, yeah, I think I'll end there. Can you just leave that up? Can you leave it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay.